The reason I'm talking about Aspen right now, everybody, is, as you know from earlier lectures, Aspen had a big impact on Crested Butte and vice versa. Remember those jack trains that we used to talk about? So here's just some specific information before we get rolling. Aspen is 7,908 feet in elevation, and it's basically where Woody Creek, Maroon Creek, Castle Creek, Hunter Creek all come into the Roaring Fork River. No, not exactly, but pretty close. To the east is Independence Pass, 12,095 feet. That is the highest paved road over the Continental Divide in the United States. Rocky Mountain National Park is a higher paved road, but not over the Divide. Not over the Divide. To the west is Basalt, Carbondale, and Glenwood Springs. To the south is Crested Butte. Leadville, Colorado, 40 miles from Aspen. And on July the 4th, 1879, because of the Colorado Mineral Belt, miners from Leadville crossed Independence Pass into the Roaring Fork, and miners came from Gothic over one of the Maroon Passes and also came into the Roaring Fork. Now, at that time, the miners weren't aware of what we call today the Colorado Mineral Belt, but they knew of the existence of something like that. And the Colorado Mineral Belt, if you imagine Colorado is almost a perfect rectangle, is a line of 250 miles going southwest, 250 miles long, 50 miles wide, and in that belt, which runs from Caribou and Nederland around Boulder in the north, all the way down to Silverton in the southwest, Every precious metal mining area in the history of Colorado is in that belt, with one exception. And that is the great town of Cripple Creek, which is an extinct volcano. I talked to you earlier in this class about gold is where you find it, but silver is in ledges. You can find gold anywhere. Beaches of Nome, Alaska, extinct volcanoes in Cripple Creek, anywhere. But silver is found in consistent formations, usually at high elevation, usually with iron ore on the top of the ground, and usually in very difficult places to get into. Not always the case with gold. The region in the Roaring Fork country in 1879 was part of Gunnison County, as was Delta County, Montrose County, and Mesa County. So what today is Pitkin County was at one time part of Gunnison County. Gunnison County made up about half of the western slope when it began to open up in the late 1870s. In the year 1880, two men came into Aspen. One guy's name was Henry Gillespie. The other guy's name was Burton Clark Wheeler. And when they came in, they laid out, they, other guys laid out three towns. One of them was called Independence at 11,000 feet on the west side of Independence Pass. The other one was called Ute City, soon to become known as Aspen, and one was about 10 miles up Castle Creek, known as Ashcroft. Two of them didn't last very long. Independence, at 11,000 feet, didn't have the high-grade ore anyway, but it was very difficult to get to. Ashcroft, is a great town with two great mines, but they found out, even with the two great mines, most of the great mines were down the valley and where Aspen is today. So Aspen is going to be the biggie, and Gillespie and Wheeler file claims on Aspen Mountain, sometimes known as Ajax Mountain. Locals a lot of times refer to it as Ajax. Coming into Aspen also in 1880 from Blackhawk are two guys, Henry Cowan Haven and his clerk, Darcy Brown. Cowan Haven and Brown would become two of the most famous people ever in Aspen. Cowan Haven opened up a mercantile store and did very well as people began to flock in. Because Independence Pass was such a very difficult road, Two more roads were built into Aspen from Buena Vista. One of them came over Cottonwood Pass, and the other one came over Taylor Pass. 
So you come over Cottonwood Pass into Taylor Park, go to the north end of the park, go over Taylor Pass at 11,800 feet, drop down Express Creek into Ashcroft and keep right on going on in to Aspen. The Aspen Times and the Rocky Mountain Sun newspapers started in 1881. Aspen got a post office in 1881 and also had a school with 25 students. Aspen could only be reached from Leadville or from Crested Butte or from Buena Vista by very high and very difficult and very rough roads. Very difficult to get in. By the year 1883, Aspen had 800 people. Rich mines had now been found on Aspen Mountain, Richmond Mountain, Highland Mountain, and Red Mountain, including two of the greatest silver mines ever to open up in the West. One was known as the Molly Gibson, and the other one was known as the Smuggler. Two tremendous silver mines. During its early mining years, Aspen was very isolated and overshadowed by Ashcroft located up Castle Creek, kind of in the shadows of Pearl Pass. And two great mines were located right around Ashcroft. One was known as the Tam O'Shanter, and the other one was known as the Montezuma, in Montezuma Basin. Jack trails, and then a stage road, as you people know, ran over East Maroon Pass from Gothic to Aspen. Another jack trail ran over Pearl Pass. And we all know what I've told you, 500 burrows carrying supplies from Aspen, from, or from Aspen to Crested Butte, and then turning around and carrying supplies from Crested Butte to Aspen. Aspen did not get a railroad till November of 1887 and February of 1888. In 1881, they decided that Ute City probably was not a good name for Aspen because the Meeker Massacre had occurred in 1879, late in that year, up around Meeker, and the youths weren't exactly the most popular people in the territory or state. And as a result, one guy decided that because there were a lot of aspen trees in the area, they would name it Aspen. So once it was called Roaring Fork City, once it was called Ute City, but the final name became Aspen. Aspen had a eatery that I love, the name of the Chloride Restaurant. It called itself the Delmonico of the West. Delmonico's being probably the restaurant in New York City. They served fresh trout, fresh venison, and fresh elk steak. Aspen had 12 saloons by 1882. And horse racing, foot racing, skiing, and baseball were the top sports. Aspen was now the name of the new camp, as I've mentioned. And now into Aspen in 1881 came probably the key guy in the history of Aspen, Jerome Wheeler. No relation to Burton Clark Wheeler, who came in the year before. Jerome Wheeler was the guy who put Aspen on the map. He was born in New York in the year 1841, and he married the niece of a man named Randolph Macy. And when Mr. Macy passed away, Jerome Wheeler became one of the two top men in Macy's. And I think we've all heard of Macy's and the great parade that they have. So he's very, very wealthy as he comes into Aspen. And the reason he came into Aspen was that a couple of his friends had been here and told him that this might be a good place to invest in. So in came Jerome Wheeler. He started Aspen's first bank, capitalized at $100,000. And he brought in the first great metallurgist into Aspen, a man by the name of Walter Devereaux. And Walter Devereaux introduced Polo. He's an Englishman. They're playing polo out there in Aspen with the rich aristocrats who had grown up with the game against the cowboys who had never seen it. But the cowboys were damn good riders and they usually won even though they missed the ball often. Devereaux would go on 
to start the Colorado Hotel, the Hotel Colorado in Glenwood Springs, one of the seven great hotels on the Western Slope. And I think if we went around this room, we could get them all. I'm going to start with you, sir. Give me one. We got one of the seven already, the Hotel Colorado Glenwood Springs. The uh, Jerome Hotel. Hotel Jerome and Aspen. <laughs> Keep moving. Sheridan Hotel Telluride, very good. No, no, Western Slope. We've got four more, anybody? The La Vida Hotel in Gunnison, number four. Number five? No, no, that one was a lodge, kind of. The, uh, it wasn't really a hotel, but what's that? That's on the Eastern Slope. One in Uray, that isn't going to cut it. we got to have a name. Just, uh, What's the name of that hotel in Uray that was uh, Beaumont Hotel? <laughs> President Bush gave Dan King University who put four and a half million into that, the Private Restoration Award of the Year. Which one? Beaumont. <laughs> the Strader Hotel in Durango, very good. And we're missing one in Silverton, the Grand Imperial. Now you got the seven great hotels on the Western Slope, and the Hotel Colorado, one of the best. Wheeler now began to invest a lot of money in Aspen and publicize it. And in 1889, for $125,000 each, he built the Hotel Jerome, as in Jerome Wheeler, and the Wheeler Opera House. Both are still there today. They just hired a new director for the Wheeler Opera House the other day. Tremendous performances go on at the Opera House. The major problem in Aspen up to 1887 was the lack of a railroad. And that ended in November of that year when the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad built a narrow gauge line over Tennessee Pass, right where the 10th Mountain Ski uh, Division train, Pando, Cooper Hill area, and went all the way into Glenwood Springs, and then they ran a branch back to Aspen on November the 1st, 1887. In February of 1888, a broad gauge railroad which had been competing with the narrow gauge, built from Colorado Springs through South Park over Trout Creek Pass, up Turquoise Lake through the 2,161-foot-long Hagerman Tunnel underneath Hagerman Pass, down the Frying Pan River to Basalt, and then ran a branch line into Aspen, February 1888. By that month in that year, Aspen now had a narrow gauge railroad and a broad gauge railroad, and Gothic and Crested Butte no longer were going to be getting all the ore to the railhead here and getting supplies back into Aspen. Aspen now became the county seat. And incidentally, there's a kind of a funny story about the narrow gauge railroad. They had, a they had three stops on that railroad between Glenwood Springs and Aspen, a little more than that, but three, these are the big three. Emma, Woody, and Catherine. And there's a lady riding the train going into Aspen. And the conductor said, Emma. Train stopped and a woman got out. Woody. Train stopped and a guy got out. Catherine. Train stopped and a woman got out. A very irate woman walked up to the conductor and said, my name is Shirley and I'm not getting off this damn train till we get to Aspen. <laughs> Aspen now in the early 1880s, 1883, became the county seat of a new county carved out of Gunnison County and they named it Pitkin County for the governor of Colorado, Frederick Pitkin, last territorial governor and uh, one of the first state governors of Colorado. Aspen Times in 1882 commented on the condition of the road over Independence Pass, and I'm quoting, 
Three jacks and a jack train coming over the range yesterday from Leadville fell in the mud and were trampled out of sight by the rest of the train. What kind of condition must the roads be in when this is the case? Bad. Jacks in a mud hole, drowning, never seen again. That's a hell of a mud hole. By the late 1880s, Aspen, Colorado had become a second Leadville and the number one silver mining camp in the world. Not the U.S., the world. The two log cabins and the seven miners of 1879 had now been transformed <laughs> into a camp and a city. The Molly Gibson mine produced ore which now assayed at 3,300 ounces to the ton. Now let me explain that again. Silver is selling at a buck an ounce. 3,300 ounces to the ton is absolutely out of sight, unheard of. That means you bring one ton of debris up, rocks, muck, everything, and somewhere in that one ton of debris are 3,300 ounce, 3, ounces of silver. And your job is to be able to smelt it and find it. That's one of the richest silver strikes ever. The smuggler mine produced the largest silver nugget ever mined. It weighed 2,060 pounds and was 93% pure silver. Largest ever found. By 1892, Aspen had 12,000 people, six newspapers, two banks, an opera house, electric lights, telephone system, streetcar system, waterworks, schools, churches, two railroads, and 40 saloons. The mining camp had one of the great red light districts in the United States. Faro, Three Card Monty. You've seen that in the movies. They got three peas here and uh, three shells. And under one of those three shells is a pea and they move them around. And usually you have no prayer of finding the pea. That's Three Card Monty. Red dog, poker, dice, and roulette. Cockfighting and horse racing were very popular along with the ladies of the evening. And three of the names of the ladies of the evening were Two Bit Lil, which means you had to have a token that said Two Bits. Not exactly a high class prostitute. Poker Alice and Token Tessie were the three names of the ladies of the evening. Those prostitutes lived very, very difficult lives. Now, most of them hid their occupations, in fact, all of them hid their occupations from their families back east. When they rode back east, they said they were governesses, school teachers, dressmakers. Many of them died young from overdoses of opium and morphine or murdered by some guy who had fallen in love with them and then didn't take too kindly to other people coming in and paying for the favors. Some of them married a miner, got out of Aspen, and went on to live great lives and nobody ever knew anything about them. But those are few. When the Silver Panic of 1893 hit, Aspen nearly died. Its 1,800 miners were laid off. Railroads stopped running. Smelters shut down. Businesses closed up and investors stopped coming in. Jerome Wheeler, Henry Gillespie, Clark Wheeler, Henry Turtelot, Horace Tabor, David Hallam, David Hyman, all went broke, went into bankruptcy. You go to Aspen today, you'll see Hallam Street, Hyman Street. You ski Ajax Mountain, you see Turtle Lot Park. We already talked about Wheeler. B. Clark Wheeler was the editor and owner of the Aspen Times. I forgot to mention that a little earlier. 
Aspen's population plummeted to 700 from 12,000. It languished, a shell of its former self, from 1893 into the 1930s when it began to revive. During that 37-year period of time, Aspen survived on ranching, the timber industry, and a little farming, and hung on. Then, in the 1930s, two guys named Ted Ryan and Billy Fisk came into Aspen. They had met in 1935, attended the Olympic Games in Garmisch, Germany in, in 1936, the Winter Games, and they both vowed to set up a great ski area in the United States modeled after Europe. They came to Aspen and Ashcroft in 1936, and they toured the area led by Billy Taggart. Anybody remember that name? Taggart Hutt, right? Billy Taggart had run away to Aspen as a boy in the late 1880s. The two men fell in love with Ashcroft, and they started the Highland Bavarian Corporation. They built the Highland Bavarian Lodge in 1937 at Ashcroft. 40 feet by 70 feet, could hold 16 people in eight double-decker beds and two rooms, room and board seven bucks a night. They brought in the great French racer Andre Roach to study the region for a potential ski area. We all heard of Roach Run at Aspen. Roach Run. Roach, after looking the area over, said that Mount Hayden which is the mountain right above Ashcroft, what could match any ski area in the world with a vertical drop of 5,100 feet. The skiing that was done out of the Highland Bavarian Lodge now after 1937 involved people hiking up or by Billy Taggart taking people up to the Little Annie Mine by horse-drawn sleigh. And they skied the slopes of Mount Hayden. Fisk and Ryan had great hopes for Aspen and Ashcroft, but then World War I started, and Billy Fisk joined the RAF in England and was the first RAF flyer to be killed. He was shot over the English Channel. He managed to land his plane in an airfield near London and died shortly thereafter. The war put an end to the possible ski area on Mount Hayden. So obviously nothing is done from 1941 to 45. And then in 1939, coming into Aspen was a guy named Stuart Mace. And Stuart Mace ran sled dogs. And he took up some land from Ted Ryan. Ted Ryan allowed him to build the Toklat Lodge in 1939, and in return, Stuart Mace promised to make sure that that whole area was in a conservation easement. It was taken care of. So Stuart Mace is in in 1939. Some of you people may remember the great radio program and television series called Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. On King! On, you Huskies! That was made in Ashcroft with Stuart Mace, TV series made in, Ash in Ashcroft, starring Stuart Mace. So things began to revive around a Ashcroft in 1939. When the Maces came to Ashcroft, cattle roamed all over the area, and the area had been uh, nearly overgrazed to death. When they left, the Maces had introduced native vegetation, which is pretty lush today. In 2004, the Aspen Environmental Studies Group bought the Toklat property, and it's used for environmental studies today. Toklat means, Eskimo word meaning kind of the end of a glacier, T-O-K-L-A-T. -T. That was in 1939. In the 1960s, a guy named Dave Farney started a group of young people uh, called the Ashcrofters. 
and they operated out of Ashcroft, and they had kids, teenagers, and they took them all over the place, climbing high mountains. My good buddy Tom Prather worked for him, and Dave and Sherry Farney were real good friends. Tom and I used to stay there and in the 60s and ski Aspen Mountain, get this, if you had a driver's license with a Western Slope address, you skied Aspen Mountain for $5. If you didn't, it was 6 <laughs> And you rode Chair 1. Chair 1 had been put in in the late 1930s, 1938. It was a boat tow. It was like a, a rowboat with three seats, and you could take eight people, and it operated off the back of a car wheel, and it took you 500 yards right up the side of Ajax Mountain, Aspen Mountain, and you ski down. But only one boat. Today, if you go to Aspen, not too far from Little Nell, it are the remains of that famous boat tow, one of the first lifts in Colorado. Not exactly as pretentious as Pioneer, but it got people up the side of the mountain. So Stuart Mace, Dave Farney, Chair One, and then Ted Ryan in 1971 established a touring center at Aspen, and the ex-Western State ski coach Sven Wick laid out 12 different trails for him. So you go to Ashcroft today, and it's great, great touring out in that area. Enough on Ashcroft. Now we come to Whip Jones. Whip Jones had a ranch right near Aspen Highlands, Highlands Peak. And in early 18, 1959, he opened up the Aspen Highlands ski area with 4,000 acres of skiing. He wanted the Aspen Ski Corp to run it, but they wouldn't. And as a result, he got on the outs with them, and Aspen Highlands for a long time was known as the Maverick area, located up Castle Creek, not far from Aspen High School today. The first head of the ski patrol was a guy named Charlie Bolte, B-O-L-T-E, a real character. Bolte was fond of explosives and started on the Aspen Highlands ski area bash for cash, which involved somebody setting off six sticks of dynamite on one of the steepest runs on top of Aspen Highlands, and then a mass start with everybody taking the most direct line down to the bottom for a pot of money at the bottom of the ski area. Insurance companies and the ski patrol put an end to this very quickly. Now, Faust, I think that's something that you would have been fond of. <laughs> Straight shot. First guy down wins. Reminds me of Charlie Bainey and Al Johnson on the side of Gibson Ridge. Didn't have that many people, however. Highlands had the longest vertical drop of any area in the United States at that time, 3,635 feet. The original Loge lift, L-O-G-E, and I've, I've been on that lift, uh, crosses Maroon Creek, and you are 375 feet above Maroon Creek on that chair when you go across. I don't mind telling you that I had my hand around the bar as I went across that. I mean, <laughs> it's terrifying, really even for somebody who's maybe ridden a lot of lifts. In 1976, Aspen, had, Aspen Highlands had 321,000 skier days. Pretty good. And then it got involved in an antitrust suit against the Aspen Ski Corp. And even though it won, it cost a lot of money and lawyers, and the area deteriorated and by 1994, it was down to 106,000 skier days, down from 321,000. Whip Jones then donated the area to his alma mater, Harvard. Harvard sold it to a Houston developer who convinced the Aspen Ski Corporation to operate it. 
Today, if you've been by Aspen Highlands, they have put $500 million into new lifts and the base area. $500 million. And it's a tremendous area. In 1941, the National Alpine Ski Championships came to Aspen, and a great skier from Austria named Tony Mott won it, won the downhill. Tony Mott was the first guy to tuck, no turns, Tuckerman's Ravine in Maine on long skis coming off the edge of a damn cliff almost at that time and won the downhill by six minutes. <laughs> this is unheard of. The woman who won was the great Gretchen Frazier of the United States who went on to win a gold medal in the Olympic Games, one of the great alpine skiers of all time. The man who was in second place to Tony Mott was a legendary guy named Dick Durrance, who went on to become not only a great skier, he's the guy who grew up, he's an American, grew up in Austria, came back to the U.S. and was one of the first guys to introduce what we called parallel skiing in the U.S. He and his wife Miggs went on to become two of the greatest ski photographers in the West. I'm at Telluride, Colorado, 1976. Governor Lamb is there, Billy Mahoney from uh, Telluride is there, and they call this the Legends of Colorado Skiing, and they're giving out awards. And I'm giving a slideshow. And John Stevens is one of the head guys at Telluride Ski Area, and I had given John's commencement address in 1964. So I knew him well. He said, Vandenbush, next morning we're going to go up with the patrol at 8 o'clock. They had six inches of fresh powder. And we're going up with my brother Larry and Dick and Miggs Durrance are, and Billy Mahoney. Are you interested? <laughs> Am I interested? I'm riding on the chairlift with Dick and Miggs Durrance. I am skiing with Dick and Miggs Durrance, one of the highlights of my career. Dick Durrance then was in his 70s, and when he came down the hill, you could uh, took a stick of dynamite and knock, knock him off his skis, but he skied with about his skis parallel about 12 inches apart. Just tremendous. Legendary guy. Camp Hale had a big impact on Aspen. Camp Hale opened up. The United States government bought out the mining camp of Pando off of Tennessee Pass and spent $128 million in the year 1942 to build a whole series of barracks. And that's where those guys trained with mules and 70 pounds on their back and equipment that wasn't the best. I think everybody gets the idea that, boy, these guys are just skiing the damn powder every day. No, they weren't doing it. And whenever they got a couple of days off, they went over to Aspen and slept on the floor of the Hotel Jerome. And I think I've told you about that famous drink they drank, right? Did I tell you about that? No? I think maybe I did. But I'll tell you again, the only way they stayed warm, those guys told me, was to take five shots of bourbon and a chocolate malt and drink it, and it never got cold. <laughs> Sleeping on the floor of the Hotel Jerome. And their famous song was, there are systems and theories of skiing, but one thing I surely have found, the skiing's just good in the winter, but the drinking's good all year around. <laughs> and all of those guys came back, and they just made up their mind. They came back from the war alive, they were going to start ski areas. Walter Balch, Winter Park, Friedel Pfeiffer, Aspen, Max Durkham, Arapahoe Basin, Bob Parker, Vail, Pete Seibert, Vail, Earl Eaton, Vail. Legendary guys coming back with one thing on their mind, and that is to start a great ski area. In 1946, two prominent guys arrived in Aspen, both ex-members of the 10th Mountain Division. One guy would go on to be one of the great architects in America, Fritz Benedict. The other guy had been wounded pretty severely in Italy on Riva Ridge, 
How many people have skied at Vail in this class? The number one run at Vail, most famous run at Vail is Reaver Ridge. In 19, when Vail opened up in 64, I just started skiing. Two years, uh, not very good. Three students and I go over to Vail. Two of them get drunk the night before and never skied. Tim Duell is going into the Navy and I, we're up and at him right off of the bat. Nine o'clock, we are in line. A blizzard is raging. Twelve inches of snow has fallen. And we're the only guys in the lift line. One ski patrolman ahead of us. One ski patrolman. We ride up, you can't see anything. I said, Tim, I said, I don't know where the hell we're going. You can't see anything. But I said, let's follow that ski patrolman. We can see his tracks. So here's Van and Bush. Boy, I tell you, I am just doing so good. Stem turn to the left. Stem turn to the right. Man, I, I think I'll be in the Olympic Games. <laughs> and all at once, I fell off the edge of a cliff. <laughs> I was on Reaver Ridge. I didn't really fall off the edge of a cliff. It's called Tourist Trap. Remember, remember Tourist Trap? It's kind of a steep shot, not too far. That was my introduction to Vail. First year it opened. Can you imagine today, 12 inches of powder and nobody in the lift line? <laughs> well, whenever they got great snow at Crested Butte, I, I couldn't be caught dead at Crested Butte because the, the line was too long. I go to Monarch and ski the powder, and then the next day I come and ski at Crested Butte because every local in the business is lined up, right? Ready to go. So these two guys are now in Aspen. And then coming into Aspen, the head of the Container Corporation of America from Chicago, Walter Pepke, and his wife Elizabeth came into town in 1946, and they met Friedel Pfeiffer, and they started the Aspen Ski Corporation. Aspen Ski Corp, 1946. Initially, the Aspen Ski Corporation was a real estate company that bought and sold old buildings and bought land up in Aspen. Really had nothing to do with skiing. Pepke and his wife Elizabeth now wanted to combine culture with sports. And one of the other guys that came into Aspen in 1946 was a guy named Johnny Litchfield, 10th Mountain. Johnny Litchfield opened up a great bar and eating establishment called the Red Onion. You could get the skier special in the middle 60s, hamburger, fries, and a Coke, a buck 50. Percy Rideout, another guy, 10th Mountain. And these guys began to open up new runs on Aspen Mountain. The area opened up in 1946 with Chair One. And Chair One, if you never had a chance to ride it, Chair One is a single chair, and you got a blanket that goes over your legs before you get to the top. It doesn't run anymore. Single chair, blanket over the legs to keep you warm as you ride up the side of Ajax or Aspen Mountain. The Roach Cup race brought many prominent skiers in now as the Roach Run, Roach Race was run at Aspen. Dick Durrance came to town and stayed. Steve Knowlton, 10th Mountain Division, came to town. Fred Isselin, one of the great teachers, came to town. In 1950, Aspen was chosen for the World Ski Championships. Elizabeth Pepke, with some help from her husband, now started the Aspen Institute which brought in the top intellectuals and musicians in the world to Aspen every year. At the Goethe Festival in 1947, Albert Schweitzer, the most famous man in the world, came to Aspen. They still have the Aspen Institute today. The best of the best come into Aspen in the summer. Aspen now took off. Steve Knowlton started the Golden Horn, a rollicking bistro. And Knowlton had, you know, he'd uh, kind of pretend he was Bob Hope or pretend he was uh, Bing Crosby. He had all kinds of pantomimes. People loved it. Johnny Litchfield and the Red Onion. Red Rollins was the mountain manager. 
Darcy Brown was now the head of the Aspen Ski Corp. Stein Erickson was there doing flips every noon. And, of course, he was a little late in the game when it came to flips, as we know. Who's the greatest skier ever in the Gunnison country just passed away? I hope we don't forget his name. Doing flips on Quicks Hill in 1938. Carl Easterly. Ladies and gentlemen, let's jot that down. This is common knowledge now, isn't it? Carl Easterly. Then came Friedel Pfeiffer. Then came the Kennedys. Then came the McNamaras. Then came all the big guns. There were two ski areas that had all the prominent movie stars. Sun Valley, Idaho, and Aspen, Colorado, which was now known all over the world. Aspen became known all over the world, and four ski areas opened up. Aspen Mountain, Aspen Highlands, Buttermilk, and in the middle 1960s, they opened up another one just west of town called Snowmass. So Aspen now had four ski areas, and Aspen Mountain became famous. The best description I ever heard of Aspen Mountain was by Carolyn Cerise, who graduated from Western. Her name is Baraba now. She's the head of guest services. Had a chance to ski with her a couple of years ago in my favorite area called Bell Mountain. Face of Bell, Ridge of Bell, Back of Bell. Takes you right into Spar Gulch and Copper Bowl. And she said, it's a small mountain, but it skis big. It's very true on Aspen Mountain. Ruthie's Run. Named for Ruthie Brown, the wife of Darcy Brown. Aztec, Dipsy Doodle, Spar Gulch, Copper Bowl, Bell Mountain, and the Roach Run. Some of the classics on Aspen Mountain. Then into the Aspen area came one Hunter Thompson. Fear and loathing in Las Vegas. Lived at Woody Creek, hung out at the Woody Creek Tavern. And I've been trying to figure out this famous comic strip starring the Duke. What the hell's the name of that comic strip? Doonesbury. Bear. Thank you very much. Doonesbury. And Hunter Thompson was the Duke. Usually hopped up on drugs and had a long filtered cigarette. And Hunter Thompson held court at the Woody Creek Bar. Wrote one great work after another. Ran for sheriff one year in the early 1970s on the campaign slogan of legalize marijuana. Man ahead of his time. <laughs> Committed suicide about 10 years ago. Hunter Thompson, one of the legendary guys. Now some of you guys may know this guy, so if I uh, screw up the name, pardon me. Rob Pimentel. Pemintel, thank you very much. On June the 17th, 1980, Pemintel, 33 years old of Crested Butte, took off in a Cessna 310 and headed for Crested Butte from Aspen. Because the airport was closed in Crested Butte, he flew on to Gunnison with a total of six people and himself in the plane. The next morning, the party lifted off from Gunnison at 11 a.m. in clear weather, heading back to Aspen. At the same time, four men in a Cessna 182 took off from Sardi Field in Aspen. They were heading for Crested Butte. As the planes approached from Crested Butte and Aspen from different directions, as soon as they crossed East Maroon Pass, they collided head on and fell to the ground and crashed on the east side of the pass, killing all ten. Nine from Aspen, one from Crested Butte. After a memorial service, Friends of the Ten got Forest Service permits and raised money to build the Friends Hut, which opened up during the winter of 1985 and 6 in Upper Brush Creek. It was chosen in that spot because it was safer for winter access than East Maroon Pass. How many people have been to the Friends Hut? Next time you go, 
kind of know the story. Got a capacity of nine. On the other side of Pearl Pass, the Aspen side of Pearl Pass, is the Taggart Hut. Named for Billy Taggart, who came to Aspen in 1883 and stayed for 83 years. He ranched, briefly ran a stage line between Aspen and Dorchester, and in the 1930s, he drove a team of horses for the Highland Bavarian Lodge and guided up Castle Creek. In 1993, seven idiots went up Express Creek from Ashcroft for a two-night hut trip to the Green Ski Hut. Now, I'm being kind when I say poor judgment and hubris in the face of a major winter storm almost killed all seven. The Goodwin Green Hut is 7.5 miles from Ashcroft at 11,800 feet. The skiers were experienced, well-prepared, fit, the leader, Ken Thorpe, had climbed Mount Denali in Alaska. Despite all kinds of advance warnings that a major storm was going to drop three feet of snow and have extreme avalanche conditions and a driving blizzard, the group got off at 10 o'clock in the morning. At Richmond Ridge, they hit a blizzard and had no tents or sleeping bags. They made it through the night. But now conditions worsened, more snow, high winds. Breaking a fundamental rule, they divided up into three groups. In thigh-deep snow, some got cross frostbite and became exhausted. When the storm finally ended and the skiers were found, after rescuers put their lives in danger, seven of the, excuse me, a number of them were found at the Dorchester cabin. 10 miles away in Taylor Park. One of them made it back to Ashcroft. I just shake my head. All of the party after this, to make it worse, blame the others. One woman said they treated her like a Roman slave. They forced her to keep walking or skiing when she was tired. If she had stopped, she'd have froze to death. Just ticks me off to even have to say this. One of the other guys who came into Aspen in the 1990s, a guy named Ted Bundy, mass murderer. They had Ted Bundy lodged in the Aspen jail, and what I'm going to tell you says a lot about Aspen. While he is in court, they recess for noon. Bundy is allowed to go into the library, supposedly to bone up on something. Door is locked. Bundy jumps out of a two-story window out of the courthouse, takes a car, and heads for Grand Junction, is not seen for three weeks. When they ask people in Aspen who were near the courthouse if they saw anything unusual, they said, no, not really, except you know, one guy did jump out of the second story of the courthouse. Outside of that, no. Just like there's nothing unusual about a guy jumping out of the damn second story. They fortunately found Bundy three weeks later and executed him about a year later in Florida. One of the worst mass murders in the U.S. In 1963, right after I got to Western State, I'm heading into, we ski Cooper Hill, we're going into Denver with my buddy Art Markendorf, taught sociology. And on the way in, we were a little tired and uh, we needed a bite to eat, so we stopped at Georgetown and had a bite to eat the Red Ram. And a guy said, why don't you guys hang around? We got some good, uh, good music, some good entertainment. So we hung around and at 8.30, a guy named Henry Duschendorf came up and began playing. John Denver. John Denver. The next year we're going through, we stop. Glenn Yarborough and the Limelighters. Anybody ever heard of Glenn Yarborough? Baby, the rain must fall. John Denver did a lot to publicize Aspen. I always say that big mouth brought more people in than anybody else did. 
He was born in the summer of his 27th year. Rocky Mountain High. Sunshine on my shoulders makes me happy. The dawn is breaking. How's the hell that go now? <laughs> the taxi's waiting. He's blowing his horn. Already, I'm so lonesome I could cry. I'm leaving on what? A jet plane. I love John Denver songs. Starwood at Aspen, Annie's song. God, is one great song. I thank God I'm a country boy. Thought I'm missing one, but I'm not. John Denver died off the California coast, a very young man, when he ran out of gas in his airplane. And he ran out of gas because when he switched from one tank to the other, it didn't switch. And he crashed. And uh, we lost a hell of a good man. I think I love John Denver singing. I told you the story, I think, in this class about Jim Greer and Jack Nicholson, didn't I? Yeah. And I told you that story very good. I'm not going to tell it again. In 1967, Tony Delmas was running, I think, the Matterhorn at Crested Butte. He was 10th Mountain. Tom Prather and I and Tony Delmas go to Aspen, spend the night at Dave and Sherry Farney's place. They, uh, Sherry drives us up to Ashcroft the next morning, and we ski to the Taggart Hut on head standard skis with a lift attachment. You lift your heel up. It's a beautiful day. Next morning, blizzard. We go over Pearl Pass and ski all the way down to the Veltri Ranch in one of the great ski expeditions of my career. Once we got in the trees, if you can imagine skiing off Pearl Pass in the powder with about 12 inches, it's sensational. But it was very tiring. Aspen today, 5,900 people, four major ski areas, tremendous tourism. One of my very good friends named Patsy Clifford co-authored a book called Aspen, Dreams and Dilemmas. Dreams and Dilemmas. Be careful what you wish for. You can always get too many people. I love Aspen, but in the summertime, I mean, it's so crowded, it's hard to get a parking spot. Might as well park at El Jebel and hike. <laughs> Today, you see all kinds of Lear jets in the Aspen Airport. The Maroon Bells is the most photographed spot in all of Colorado. The Aspen Institute brings some of the best people in the world in every year. And even though Crested Butte was number one, Gina Craw brought him in. The first two years, Crested Butte had the X Games. Now Aspen has the X Games. Unbelievable publicity, right? Unbelievable. One of my good friends, Mike Majeko, a downhill or Western State, he thought all these guys in these damn half pipes, a bunch of, you know, he had no respect for them at all. In the Olympic Games in Salt Lake City in what, 2000, 2004, whenever it was, Majeko, when the uh, hill closed, got in that half pipe and said scared the hell out of him. And from that time on, he had enormous respect for Aaron Blunk and all the other guys who, it's a damn ice rink, shooting you 20 feet up into the air. It's unbelievable. That concludes Aspen. We got more to go, though, and it's going to be sustainability. Any questions on Aspen? Let's take a... A jackass is a burrow. You didn't say jackass, you said jackass. Well, jack or jackass is a burrow. Thank you. That's what I thought. Now, you know, some people may have referred to me in that respect <laughs> also. I don't know. Five-minute break. All right, folks, here we go. I was just reminded one more thing in Aspen I should have mentioned when the uh, great skier Spider Savage was killed by the ex-wife of Andy Williams, who was his current girlfriend, Claudine Langer, at a party featuring probably a little cocaine. It was a hot dog. 
a hot tub. <laughs> In any case, uh, she got off. How she got off, I'll never know, but she got off. Um, when I talked, uh, Western is having a kind of an agricultural sustainability conference today, and I gave a little talk this morning at 9 o'clock, and uh, one of the things I wanted to do was finish off with sustainability in Crested Butte and the Gunnison country. And I started off by giving them about two minutes of my own personal experience in Upper Michigan. Uh, you, I shouldn't say you, we now. Uh, Colorado is roughly, Crested Butte is roughly on the 37th to 38th parallel. Where I grew up is between 47 and 48, 10 degrees higher. What that means is that you get a lot more sunlight, the days are longer, uh, except at certain times of the year when the days are longer in Upper Michigan. Uh, but that makes a big difference when you talk about sustainability. But I grew up on a dairy farm in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, and we uh, had about 25 cows, so we always had milk, we always had cream, we made our own butter, we always had our own beef. My father, uh, about once every six months, would have a heifer, and he'd shoot him right in the middle of the forehead with a 22. I would slit the throat and catch the blood in a pan and take it into my mother, and we would, uh, she would make blood sausage, which is made with potatoes and onions and a little bread, and it's absolutely delicious but very rich. And we would clean out the intestines and put the blood sausage in the intestines. There's no Belgian custom. So in addition to that, we made our own maple syrup because on my farm we got a, a great maple forest. Uh, my mother and I, when we first got to the farm, I was the oldest. We would pick raspberries, blackberries, gooseberries, hazelnuts, choke cherries, and all of that would be canned. And then in the wintertime, we would have Raspberry shortcake, blackberry shortcake, etc. Made all use of that. I was in charge of the garden. There wasn't a rock in the garden, a weed in the garden, and to this day, I prefer uncooked food. I would squeeze the peas out of the pot. I like peas a lot more raw than I do cooked. At carrots, I clean the dirt off, eat the carrots. We had melons, beans, onions, tomatoes watermelons, all in the garden. And I'd go around uh, chewing grain or barley. Little did I know that I was way ahead of my time when it came to eating the proper diet. Made our own ice cream. So everything is pretty self-sustainable. My mother made the best bread in the world from flour we got from grinding our own grain. And I told the legendary story for me, we were on the rural route, a mail route, and a guy named John Jocola for 35 years uh, brought the mail. I don't know how the hell he knew it, but he always knew when my mother made bread. And John Jocola would carry the mail into the house, and here's what the conversation was like without a word being changed for 35 years. John would say to my mother, his name was Ruby. Ruby, I thought I'd bring the mail in today. And my mother would say, well, John, thank you very much. Could I interest you in a loaf of bread? And John would say, don't mind if I do. This went on for 35 years with both, both parties never acknowledging that they knew what the hell was going on. So that was sustainability. Now, in the Gunnison country, in 1872, Alonzo Hartman, on Christmas Day, rode into the Gunnison cow camp. And he ran cows for use for the Los Pinos Indians at their agency. The following year, the Parsons Expedition came into the Gunnison country. And this was a geological and geographical expedition led by John Parsons of Denver with about 20 guys. When they left in September, early September, one man stayed and walked 600 miles all over the Gunnison country, finding the coal deposits, the marble deposits. But the one thing that interested Sylvester Richardson more than anything 
were the great valleys with all that great water from the East River and the Slate and Coal Creek and Taylor River and the Gunnison and the Tamichi flowing through, and pretty obvious with the high mountains you'd have great water all the time. And he envisioned a great farming area. And the following year, after establishing the Gunnison Colony, he brought 20 residents into what today is Gunnison. And they took up ranches. And they began to clear away the sagebrush. And they began to dig irrigation ditches, and that's why we got those great hay meadows today. I can't, I can't tell you what kind of a debt we owe to those people and the hard work they went through, and they didn't have the mechanization that we have today in taking out stumps and cleaning out the sagebrush to give those beautiful hay meadows that we have today. Initially, every rancher who took up a ranch thought, there is no way that we can ever have any farming in the Gunnison country because the growing season, they found out, was 70 days. The average frost-free day in the Gunnison country, historically, is June the 28th. The average, when the first frost hits, is September the 11th. The average high water is June the 11th. We won't get that far this year. So hardly anybody worried too much about having any farming or having any gardens, and everybody kind of turned to ranching. Prior to the Denver, Denver South Park and Rio Grande Railroads coming in, however, Gunnison had to be self-sustainable in some stuff. And they were self-sustainable in beef, because cows had been driven in, dairy and otherwise, from Denver and Texas. So you had milk, you had beef, and then creameries got started, and you had butter, and you had cheese, and you had cream. So some of the stuff was done long before the railroads came in. Then the railroads came in in 81 and 82. And when the railroads came in in 81 and 82, by that time, the Gunnison country was one of the great ranching areas in the world not just in the United States. In 1900, Gunnison Country, the Gunnison Country had 40,000 cows, 10,000 horses, 1,000 hogs, 200 oxen, and 300 ranches. It boggles the mind today to say that. One of the great ranching areas that ever existed anywhere, at any time. Creameries, creameries got started almost immediately. One of them was called the Gunnison Creamery, located on South Main Street, with a capacity of 1,000 pounds of milk a week. One of them was called the Ohio Creek Creamery at Castleton, about 15 miles up Ohio Creek, 1,500 to 1,600 pounds of milk, and producing cheese and butter locally, as well as selling it elsewhere, using it locally and selling it elsewhere. And then we had the Howville Creamery, located Jack's Cabin, Jack Howe. As early it was called Howville, later on it was called Jack's Cabin. And there they had a dairy and milk house and produced 15 pounds of butter every week. Harry Cornwall has left us with a great memoir of what went on. And right next to Harry Cornwall's ranch, when he left Irwin, his father took up a ranch, was a guy named John Baum, a German, B-O-H-M. And John Baum sold butter, made butter and sold it. And Harry Cornwall is over to find, uh, get some butter one day, and he goes into the blockhouse, which is very cold, and he saw a sheet lying over something. And Harry said, John, what's that? And John Baum said, oh, he said, that's my wife's cousin. He died in November, and we're keeping him here till the ground 
thaws out and we can bury him maybe in May or June. Harry Cornwall bought no butter that day <laughs> and found it very difficult later on to buy any kind of butter. The damn thing was used <laughs> as a blockhouse. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, Philip Yaklich. Philip Yaklich had a creamery also. You bet. There were, there were others also. And I interviewed Philip, and I think I mentioned that to you. Yes, he peddled, uh, peddled the milk around Crested Butte very early, right? So we got butter, we got cheese, we got milk, we got cream. Then came one of the worst cattle sheep conflicts in the United States around the turn of the century. There are two reasons for this conflict. One, the minor one, was racial, because the cattlemen tended to be Anglo and the sheep herders tended to be Basque or Hispanic. But the big one was economic, because there's only a certain amount of ground available for grazing, and the sheepmen wanted it and the cattlemen wanted it. Up at Obi Joyful, William Kreitzer, a forest ranger, had a pistol stuck in his stomach by a cowboy who had a little more too much to drink and marched off into the timber and he thought he was going to die. They ran 1,100 cows off the cliffs on OB Joyful, 1,100 sheep off the cliffs at OB Joyful. They bludgeoned 1,500 to death in Taylor Park and killed another 1,100 at Iola. There are some families in the Gunnison country that have never spoken to each other ever since. And the cowboys had masks, and their horses' hooves were shod. And some were brought in from the outside. Some were local. But when William Kreitzer came in, the federal government now got involved, and he made it plain that this is now a federal offense. In 1934, we had the Taylor Grazing Act. Taylor Grazing Act took out of federal lands all non-forest land owned by the federal government. It was land that had no timber on it, and a lot of the land wasn't that good, and hardly anybody wanted it. But for a long time, guys have been cutting timber on it, mining on it, and grazing on it, and paying nothing. The first director of the Taylor Grazing Act was Farrington Carpenter, Harvard-educated, from Hayden, Colorado. He got the job because Ed Taylor was our fourth district representative, and Ed Taylor was the guy who started the Taylor Grazing Act. And Farrington Carpenter, I had a chance to interview about four times, grand old gentleman, when I was doing a book on the Western Slope with Dwayne Smith, sat on his porch and had three, four wonderful conversations with Mr. Carpenter. And Farrington Carpenter told me that they had a big cattle-sheep conflict at that time going on, and he knew there was going to be trouble. So he decided that he would have a big meeting of anybody who was a rancher or a sheepman at Glenwood Springs. And the word went out that if anybody didn't show up, they probably weren't going to get any grazing permits. You had a show. And he had one big table or a series of tables in a circle. And on one nameplate, cattleman, sheepman, cattleman, sheepman. So all the cattlemen couldn't sit together and all the sheepmen couldn't sit together and they had to say, would you please pass the salt? And Farrington Carpenter said that he told everybody, he said, fellas, we got two questions to answer tonight. One of them I think we'll finish off in 18 seconds. The second one will take a little longer, but we'll get it done. Number one question, he said, the federal government and Harold Ickes, my boss, Secretary of Agriculture, has instructed me to tell everybody at the meeting tonight that we can either solve who is going to get what, or we can let the federal government make that decision. All in favor of the federal government, raise your hand. Not one hand went up. And Carpenter looked at his watch and said, well, it took 19 seconds. I didn't think it'd take that long. He said, now let's get to work. And now they got to work handing out the permits, 
and deciding who was going to get what. Now, the Rosmans probably know this better than I. In the Gunnison country, the dividing line was Cimarron. Cattle would be east of Cimarron, sheep would be west of Cimarron in the Encompagre Valley. Little known, however, that a guy named Otis Moore led the Wool Growers Association in the Gunnison country, and I got a picture of him taking a big load of wool out in 1936. But he wasn't a very popular guy. We're out of time. We're out of here. <laughs> We're not meeting next week. We're meeting on the 23rd. We'll all finish off sustainability and have your questions ready to go for the big three who are going to be in here. Thank you very much. We're out of here.